three of them. Oh, like the island.
So I really, really try to draw from that again and just, like, just draw both of them. And then so I did not get the rest of these two. I was going to watch them. No, I think they're all. Thank you. 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 Thank because and if I ever open a bar, I'm going to name it the dog house. <laughs> <laughs> that way when somebody calls and says, Where are you? You just simply say, I'm in the dog house. Um because my kids are out this week. I was out last week. And so we're trying to adjust all the schedules. And between us, um there's no few comments that UAB is more important than the family. <laughs> Which isn't true. But that's okay. Let me just say I'm going to pick up kids. Uh, well, I have, I've been shuttling around. So we want to just do it. We can do it right off my, or where you want to go? Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm doing it for mine. I'm doing it for yours. Real quick. Whatever so I chose to do something. Do we have, how many do we have online? Uh, there's about five. And did they get the slides also? Yes. Oh, and did they get the handout also? Yes. All right, so everybody got a handout. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna do something a wildly different today, <laughs> wildly different, because I don't. Uh, I've given you the foundations of the hypothesis test, right? Give me the let's let's refresh memory. I know you haven't heard me rant in a few weeks, so every every hypothesis test can be thought of as what? Not all at once. What? A trial, a jury trial. It's all it is. The the jury mechanism and the scientific method and the way we've worked the hypothesis, the statistical methods in line up one to one, so that when we end up safe or doing a jury trial, we always assume something to be true, which is technically a hypothesis. We assume it to be true, but we assume the innocence and we proceed to do the trial in order to see if the evidence is convincing enough to allow the decision of guilty. I can, I can, I can, play you can go from there? I can play from here. Okay. So, what I wanted to do today is instead of just doing PowerPoint over and over, let's see if we can get this to fire off. Well, I'm waiting for it. It doesn't seem to, I'll say, open as a web page. No, it doesn't seem to be responding. Oh, I said that. Okay, give me a minute. I'll, I'll go give upstairs minute. and get, get, this, get it on a flash drive. Right, that would be fine. No, oh, because the whole thing's frozen. Lovely. All right. My mistake. Not hers. <laughs> my, honestly, my mistake, because in my rush to get here, I did not drop into a USB drive. But what I was going to do today, instead of going through all of the stop again, but we've got the foundation, is let's actually talk about at the end of a trial, at the end of your experiment, what is the statistician doing? Because often you will think, okay, I need a p-value, right? I mean, that's, what, that's what's been burned into everybody's head. What is my p-value? And the p-value is the probability of getting the test statistic, or one even more extreme, under the firm belief the null is true. In other words, you had no scientific impact. Whatever you were trying to do, Bernie, you failed. You did not do it. Okay? And is there evidence otherwise? What I wanted to do today was just to go through, suppose that we had to do a two-sample t-test. This is what the statistician is looking at. And you should request a review of it with the methodologist. In other words, you do not ever want an e a p-value emailed into you. I think that that is one of the most dangerous things that can ever happen. There's only one thing more dangerous, and I advise all junior faculty and all students and all graduate students and even the senior faculty 
never do this. You know what the more dangerous of the two is? For me to email you that output and say you interpret it because that's equally dangerous. Because one of the things I want to point out to you as we get going is even under the simplest of cases when we do like a two sample t test where we're going to say does the mean of one population equal the mean of another population against the belief that they're not equal. If I show you the output there are three p-values on the page. Which of the three do you pick? And you must remember, here's one rule to remember for today. Always remember, if you see a p-value, you have to ask yourself, what was the hypothesis test? One of the things that amazes me in the literature is I can read the literature and see a p-value, but even with all my training, I have no idea. What in the world could they have tested? We're still having trouble? I don't know what to do with this. What? It's because I'm trying to hurry. It is probably because you're trying to hurry. But I apologize. Hmm? I apologize. Mm -hmm. All right, where is it? Okay, here we go. Is that right, Bridget? Right there? This one? No, that may be it. I think your folder there that's yellow at the bottom is trying to open it. There it is. Yeah. That's it. Thank you for being my eyeballs today. All right, test. There we go. Let's, there see, if, let's, see, if, let's see if it pops. Let's see if it pops it open. There we go. That's good. All right. So let's just start walking through this. Okay. And again, it is only. Do you want to use this or you want to use the little one? Um. Which one? I'm fine with. Um, I'm fine with this. As soon as I can figure out how to close some stuff. So all right. So. As you can see, oh, not great, necessarily. As you can see, I was prepping this at 3 a.m. <laughs> if you look at the date and the time. Um, so why am I doing, why am I showing you this? Because this first example is very simple, okay? Is, there was a hypothesis test. Had a set of 40 cells that were normal lymphocytes and measured diameter. My, and then we had tumor cells and the hypothesis being that the tumor cells might have a different characteristic or different mean than regular cells. And whenever we go about it, we always talk about statistics being descriptive statistics. The danger of all the statistical software is that it will always give you so much. But the catch here is, again, we began with just saying we want to compare the two populations. All right, so just looking at the output, I want to talk to you. I want to walk you through it. What is the population mean for the lymphocytes? 6.95. You're wrong. I said population mean. That is nothing on this sheet has anything to do with the parameters. Everything on the sheets are statistics. So that is a sample mean. You must forgive me because I deliberately set you up. <laughs> set you up. So you see that the mean, the sample mean, which is my best estimator of the mean for lymphocytes is 6.95. It's my natural estimator, but it's a statistic. That's the one I'm going to use to try to make an inference. And all I'm really going to do, you know, without going through all the formulas, is I'm going to try to compare these two means. That's all I know. If the null hypothesis is true, which says mu1 equal mu2, then what has to be true about the two sample means? Just think about it. 
if they're both natural estimators of the population that they come from, and the means are in fact equal, what should be the relationship between the sample means? They should be not significantly different. They'll not ever be equal unless somebody messed up the data. Okay, but they should be very close together. Remember, statistics will vary, in the re and they bounce around any of any parameter that they're trying to estimate. The same idea of why we take serial blood pressures on individual, because we know there's it's bouncing. One read is not enough. My dad was a classic example of the white coat effect. His blood pressure when he first went into the doctor's office was always really high. His, his primary physician, the old family doctor as I call him, uh, knew very well. He talked to dad for 10 minutes, but he would take three or four blood pressure readings on dad and watch him, of course, steadily be lower because the white coat effect was going away. But the, the issue here is if we look at our output, if we look at it, and the key thing I want to emphasize here is I chose to go with the three most common, not the three only, but the three most common requests I get per week. Can you help me with a very basic two-sample test? Because a lot of research is just pick, comparing group A, group B on a continuous. Then some people will come in and say, can you compare the means? for ANOVA. Now, ANOVA is analysis of variance, but all that means is you've got more than two. You want to compare three groups. Maybe you want to compare four groups. Maybe you want to get it more complex. But they're always the same principles. You're going to end up with having to choose from among multiple approaches, even if it's a two-sample t-test. So if you look here, and I'm we're just going to refresh your memory. I mean, we've got our p-values here. We've got we've got one here called the probability greater than the absolute value of t for the pool, which assumes equal variances. And you see in there that it generates a p-value. It doesn't throw you a type one error right now. It just gives you a p-value, and it says it's shockingly small. Well, that makes sense. Honestly. Go back and take a look. Look at where the sample means are. Are they really close together? No, they're not close together at all. One's 6.95, the other one's 17.92. Your standard deviations are much smaller. They are very, very far apart. So the sample means are so disparate, you've already got very good preliminary information that the population means aren't going to be lining up. Therefore, you should reject the null and move to the alternative. You can eyeball that just by their magnitude right here and the fact that you got a t-statistic t of 21. They're, most of them should fall between negative 3 and positive 3. So this is shockingly big information indicating that the cells actually have very different types. All right, but the key here is, and under this one, bad teaching example. Which of these two, which of the three should you pick? I mean, it's a very bad teaching example. It teaches me to take the time to do this early in the morning. Which of the three p-values do you want? Less than 0 0.001, less than 0 0.001, or 0 0.0001? Which one do you want? Hey, which one do you want? Talk to me. Because this is one of those things why, where you want to sit down and talk to a methodologist. Which one would you want? And how do you decide? And this, remember I tell you, told you every time I came in here, there is one take-home message per lecture. The first one was to understand what really goes on when we do statistics. We're doing a trial and to understand what a p-value really is, okay? It's, it's not anything to do with truth. It's everything to do with data. The, other, the next lecture was to go over the, the concepts of power and how you have to imagine what is happening if you're successful. 
This one is to teach you one thing. And here's the take home message. Before you submit any abstract, before you submit any grant, before you submit any manuscript, ask yourself what assumptions were being made in the statistical test. Okay? The, the reason it is so dangerous just to be handed a p-value is the p-values depend on the assumptions. And I'm going to walk you through how the statisticians know which test to pick today and show you the type of information you should be requesting before submission. You don't have to be able to explain it all. You have to be able to have knowledge that those were checked. Otherwise, you may not be able to reproduce your results. Or better yet, if someone says, hey, I want to see it, it's always a chance somebody's going to say, I think we should do something else. But even then, at least you can say, here's the graph, we checked it. And did you hear what I just said? All the assumptions are checked with graphs, specific graphs. Okay? And in fact, what I would emphasize to you as you're developing a project, as you're writing your specific aims, is a worthwhile exercise just to take, just to take 15, 20 minutes and ask yourself, if I'm successful, what graph will show it? How would I show success in a figure? Okay? That's key. Because if you look at every grant application I have written in the past 21 years, it always has the same phrase in it. I guess technically that's plagiarism. Self-plagiarism. I guess technically it is. But what it always states is the following thing. We will examine histograms, residual plots, and normal probability plots to assess which method to apply. I state that I have to see the graphs. It's a sentence in every one of my applications that I help people write. Why? Because it's the truth. Also, by saying it, it's clearly indicating a statistician wrote it. Because only, we're the only ones that are really eager to go see these graphs. Because then they are essential to us. Okay? So here's the catch, all right? I want you to flip to the, okay, well, take on the, on the screen, go down to slide two, and I want to start talking to you about the two graphs that we, or the graphs that I need. And again, I'm not, I can't give you a PhD in biostatistics in an hour lecture, but we're going to start with the histograms and the box plots. So you see that, actually, hmm? talk to me. Oh, like Jacqueline, talk to me. I had data with a badge. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about uh, CC plots and looking at the normality. Uh -huh. And how when we did it in class, we looked at the graph and we thought it was normal because it had a straight line, but we didn't check the hypothesis. Okay, now wait, so it's okay. Now, it's okay. You're not guilty of anything. You're not guilty of one, one solitary thing at all. The only reason to check this, okay, is that this, that those two, we'll look at the QQ plots in just a minute, is if the QQ plots are bad, get away from the t-test. That's what it's telling you, is if they don't hug the line, you need to kind of back away and say, is there another procedure? And that's what the graphs are. They're, I always kind of chuckle when you go to the textbooks and there are all these flow charts of normal. No, go this way. Normal, yes, go this way. I wish it was that easy. A lot of times it's very hard to make the judgment. Sometimes I refuse to make the judgment. I do all sides of the, of the flow chart and then see if they're shockingly different. 
It's called in parlance, we cover ourselves by calling that a sensitivity analysis. It's actually mean we're just going to make certain that everything's consistent. That's all. So if we look at the histograms, remember first assumption of a t-test is what? <coughs> Normality. There is the big deal. You want the data. Specifically, you want each population, each group that you are studying to have somewhat of a bell shape to it. Does it have to be perfect? No. It's data, folks. There's going to be some deviation. But both of these are very well represented, appearing to be normal distributions. The other thing that's nice about having the histograms is the histograms kind of naturally tell you where the center of the data is. Are those two centers lining up? Absolutely not. So this by itself is strong contradiction of the null hypothesis because the two distributions have clearly separated. Or better yet, the sampling distributions have separated. Now the box plots or the box plots which hide underneath are also very useful because they tell you if there are outliers in your data set. Do you see any outliers? No. The fences go all the way out. And if we had any outliers, we would see in the box plots below the histograms little dots indicating these points are way too extreme. Why do you look at the graphs? To see the normality and to see if there's outliers. Because the other thing, none of my methods are robust to an outlier. You give me one really bad data point and I don't catch it, the whole story can change. Now, what do I do with one really bad, odd data point? Talk to me. I take it back to the clinician. I just can't chunk it. I can't do that. That's not right. That's called data cleaning. I take it back to the investigator, and then we have to say, is an error in recording? No. Is there something wrong with that specific experiment that you think makes it not valid? We have to. And otherwise, we have to include it and try another method that would be somewhat more robust. So you're always looking at these graphs to check. But this graph here tells you almost everything I need to know except for one thing. Well, that tells me two things, okay? So the other reason to have that box plot Going down a little bit further, now the box plots are at the top of the of the page. Do you think the spread of the two population or the two samples is the same? Do you think the variance or how far they're spreading out is the same? No. You need a visual judgment of that. Okay? So you've made a conclusion already based on the, the shape of the data and the graphs. The variances are not equal. You think you, you're comfortable enough on that graph to make the judgment call. Graphs don't line up, right? I mean, the variances are different. Well, that tells you which of the two tests to go to. Do you see here? You've got the idea of are the variances equal or are the variances unequal? That's why the graph is there so that it will help you to pick which of the two t-tests to use. Because here's the thing, when I say t-test, how many t-tests are there? How many types? Two. Hmm? two. There are two on that page. I can, get, <laughs> I can get you textbooks that have 50 that have different variations, okay? But you have to pick among the different <coughs> ones to report. And based on those box plots, I would be most comfortable coming to you and saying, we are going to report the t-test assuming unequal variances in the two populations, okay? So does it change your conclusion? No. 
doesn't change your conclusion at all because this p-value is very, very, very low. We should not have seen this type of evidence if the two population means are equal. But this is the type of information. And when you go to report, you just can't give the p-value. You have to be able to say what was the hypothesis test, what procedure did you use. Two sample t-tests assuming unequal variances needs to appear. At the podium, you need to say that. You need to be comfortable enough to say, this is what we did and what. Do you have to show all the graphs? No. You do have them in your back pocket if you need to. Now, you see down here, this comes with this in the other one. Equal, equality of variances. Now, I'm going to give you a war story, okay? I have seen, I won't tell you in what group I've collaborated with, someone be handed this. The abstract's about to go in. We are doing a two-sample t-test. Okay, we're doing a two-sample t-test. And the p-value for the pooled sample, where you would assume the variances are equal enough that you're, you're not going to have to use a special method, was a p-value of like 0.5495. Nowhere near significant. Those two sample means were pretty much very close together. There's no evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Very little evidence. The, side, the unequal was, again, because it tends to have fewer degrees of freedom, it was slightly higher. It was sitting right at like at 0.58. The test down here had a p-value of 0 0.0039. And the investigator had picked that one and put it in the abstract and declared things significant. And I was like, absolutely not. Stop the process. Don't even submit it. Because this one has nothing to do with means. This was testing the equality of variances. And this says the variances are not equal. Okay? The other reason to meet with the statistician, honestly, and the methodologist, is I just taught you, or at least I explained to you, that on my day-to-day -day practice, I make my judgment off the box plots. I make my judgment off the box plots. I don't make my judgment off of that hypothesis test. Do you know why? Or I don't make the judgment off of the equality of variances hypothesis test. I'll give you two good reasons. Again, not trying to drum up business, but two good reasons to always talk to a methodologist, even if it's five minutes, and say, can you check this? Any two guesses why I don't use that? Right. I do not like, and in fact, this test has been highly criticized in statistical literature of it is a bad practice to use a hypothesis test to inform the next hypothesis test because you're just doing multiplicative more and more hypothesis testing that you should probably build and check the assumptions based on graphs and operate with one judgment for a type 1 error. Try to make one judgment and go with it and limit the overinterpretation of p-values. So in one after another after another. The other reason, that's, that is the primary reason I do not ever look at that test. The second reason is any slight deviation from normality. This test is horribly sensitive to it. The data really needs to be normally distributed or else it falls apart. And that's the danger of just, I'm not trying, to, I want you to have as many skills as you can. But I also want to emphasize you don't ever try to work in a vacuum. Because you can easily look at that and go, oh, okay, I can make the judgment. But you don't know all the ins and outs of not every test is always a robust test. Not always a great test. Okay? All right, now here's the other thing. There's two things. We had to make the judgment about equal variances or unequal. We did that. Then the big one is to say, are the data normal? And, you know, this is why people really... Um, 
people are very critical of SAS, which is the language I use to do all this. I'm okay with them being critical about it, that's okay, because really a lot of times SAS gives you so much information, it's information overload. I can make the judgment of normality either through the QQ plots here, where we have, can, you know, seen Q, who, has, who has not seen a QQ plot before? Okay, that's fine. What a QQ plot is, is a very simple thing. If it's following a normal distribution, I can tell you how much of the data should fall below a certain cut point. Remember that the, when you do when you do an introductory stats class, one of the first things they try to teach you is plus or minus three standard deviations, 99.9% .9 of all the data fall between, them, between those two cut points. We come down to two standard deviations, and we get approximately 95% of all the data must be between those two things. And then we can come down to one standard deviation, and then 68% of the data needs to be within that bandwidth. Well, guess what? I don't have to pick one standard deviation, or two standard deviations, or three standard I can pick them all. And I can build a graph that's saying, are you obeying the law that says, if you're a normal distribution, you've got to have X percent below this amount. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just building a basic graph and setting it up and letting it follow the line. So as long as my data points are hugging that 45 degree line, you're, you're observing approximately, notice my word, approximately normal data. It's very hard to say, it is definitely normal. Okay? It's very hard to do that. But neither one of these graphs, as you are looking through them, because you've seen QQ plots, you have to make the judgment. There's nothing in that graph that makes me think this data is not normally distributed. Okay, if you were trying to make a judgment, I would worry about skewness in the tails. You would see a break or a curvature in either the lower left quadrant or the upper right quadrant. If you see it tailing away, you have heavy tails. Okay? And that is, again, got to mess your test up. All right? Again, I'm not asking you. What I want you is to have the experience of if I was coming to you to build an abstract on this data, I would have this, this piece with me, and I would walk you through each one of these, trying to help you understand why the choices are being made. That's all. I'm not asking you today to become an expert in interpreting QQ plots. I want you to be understanding if you meet with a methodologist, you should be able to say, did you check normality? Was normality important? Better yet, the only phrase you really got to have, what assumptions did we make and have you checked them? Okay? Because, again, I'm more than happy to throw myself under the bus. In my rush, I have done it before, run the analysis, quickly found the p-value for the test that I believe was most appropriate, got the abstract in, we're getting ready to present, and I start looking at the, at the graphs, and I start banging my head. Because there's an outline. Or because there's skewness. And I didn't take the time to triple check. Got to avoid that. Okay. Questions about that? No questions. You're doing a uh, t-test. You expect your data to go up or down. Can you go ahead and do a one tail after looking at it? All right. That is a great, great question. So the question to repeat is, if you believe that you're in classic one, classic one, we do a diet study. Let's just say we have one, we're going to do one study, and we, we're going to try to, we have come up with the, good friend of mine was Roland Wine Series, but he uh, passed away several years ago, but he came up with Eat Right for UAB, which is a diet that has been nationally used. Let's say we come up with Eat Right 3, because I think we're on Eat Right 2 now. <laughs> um, and we're going to roll it out. We want to see if it's an effective diet, right? Do you go on a diet? Well, some people do. Most people go on a diet to do what? Lose to lose weight. 
doesn't make sense to look for a two-tailed test, does it? It makes sense that you're expecting your data to go in a specific direction. And let's say that we take the pre-weight minus the post-weight. Then you would expect all your numbers to be positive. So you would try to do a one-tailed test. The question was, do you look at your data? And then can you decide one tail or two tail? Or do you, no, you never do that. You, that is part of your specific aim. And remember, the specific aims come first, and then after the specific aims are down, they decide what analysis I can do. So if you had indicated to me that it was going to be directional, I would have stated in the analysis plan, we will use one tail hypothesis testing. And we would have to defend it. I have seen many study sections take the diet case off the table. I've seen many study sections say, no, no, it should be two-tailed. But well, I would agree with you, we would, we would put it there and we would defend it. Okay? Do you know what p-hacking is? You ever heard the term p-hacking? How about p-shopping? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I, you, may be, you may think I'm joking, but it's, uh, it's a real thing that you keep working or changing your assumptions until you get something below 0.05 level. you got to resist that under all cases. All cases resist that. I know the pressure, but resist it to be able to say, I did it according to the scientific method. If it's a one-tail hypothesis test, go with a one-tail hypothesis test. But you know, if you use a software package like SPSS, every p-value I had on this handout for you is two-tailed. Okay? It's two-tailed. But SPSS will show you one-tail and two-tail. One-tails are always going to have smaller p-values. Always. And some people will see that smaller p-value and then decide, oh, I like that one better. Can't do it. You can't do it. It has to be decided prior to actually analyzing the data. All right? Other questions? Other questions? Before the test begins. <laughs> hmm? I'm watching the time. I'm gonna, we're going to do one more because you can, you're going to laugh at me with the last handout I gave you. I can actually do a three-hour lecture off of that last page. There is so much statistical information in there. Okay. But what I want you to do is we're going to jump over to the idea of this is the one that begins with, make sure everybody's still with us. We're going to the ANOVA. Okay, we're past all the histograms. Oh, got to switch. Um, and go to the ANOVA one. Let me switch it real quick. And we'll blow that up. So understand that. <laughs> It does not say EMAI, actually. What SAS is trying to tell you is there is that we have three groups that we are studying here. Three groups. And I labeled them E for elderly, MA for middle age, and Y for young. And I was very happy to know at 3.39 this morning that in this scientific study, I am still young. I fell within the young range, because the young range went from 89 to 48, excuse me, 18 to 49. And I thought, well, barely stayed in there, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> uh, the middle age and the elderly, what they're looking at here is from cadavers taking the femur and asking the question. Of course, we all, we all know that as we age, frailty occurs. How much force in newtons is required to fracture the femur? You would, yeah, that's what, the, that's what this experiment is. And so I have three age groups. Naturally, when I go to more than two groups, you need to stop and say, well, there goes the t-test. T-test can only operate on one sample or two samples. You go to three samples, 
you've got to get to a higher model. And what is that model typically called? Yeah. Analysis of variance. Okay? Why is it called analysis of variance? This is a great trivia question. It's something we put on every PhD comp almost. Why is it called if I'm testing, am I testing variances? Am I testing variances? No, I'm actually testing means. Why do I call it analysis of variance? That's exactly it. I am looking for, do you see the little, the little uh, triangles? Or beta, not triangles, the little squares here? The little diamonds, oh, there's the diamonds here? They represent the means of the three groups, right? They represent the means of the three groups. If they all line up, if they all line up with each other, do they have variance? No. If the means all line up, they have no variance. That's why we call it analysis of variance. It's the analysis of the variance of the sample means. That's what we're looking at. All right? Again, a graph is your best friend. A graph is worth everything. Okay? So, I'm going to tell you the two assumptions of ANOVA. Well, I'm sorry. We would have to go, um, it's more than, there are three graphs here. We're going to walk through, but I'm going to shut my mouth and let you do something. All right, you've got in front of you, the first one is the box plots, showing you the distribution by group. Then you've got what's called the residual plot, which is the next page. Okay, the residual plot also helps you test one of the assumptions. So the, listen to me, the box plot and the residual plot help you test whether the variances are equal or observe whether the variances are equal in the three groups. You have to make that assumption. ANOVA is not going to work well if every group has a different variance, if they're not consistently with regard to their spread, this method will break. It'll break. Just will not give you accurate judgments. So equal variances have to be assumed and normality. The normality plot is, I produced it separate so it would be cleaner, a better resolution. So it is technically on the part right below the distribution of pro and probability plot for residuals. It's right there. So it's on the screen now, and I'm going to give you five minutes to, to look at those, only those graphs, and then I want you to tell me, do you think the assumptions hold, or would you say, I'm worried about reporting results from this? Because that's the first thing you do. Please listen to me. Do not look at the p-values until you look at the graphs. Don't. Because then you're just going to be, oh, man. I like that p-value. I guess you have one outlier. All right. There's the first piece. There may be one outlier in the, in the data. So first observation from the graph, being the data detectives that we have to be to make the judgments of whether we report this or not, is there appears to be one outlier. We see it two ways. It's on the QQ plot because it's sitting up here, but it's, it's an outlier. It's not a trend in the data. Do you hear me? It's not necessarily a trend in the data because you don't see multiple of them tailing off on the end of the lines. But there is an outlier. What else? And look at this, look at this cute, look at this box plot right here. You see that dot? Warns you. In the residuals, there's an outlier. Okay? Okay. Which means somewhere along the way there's an extreme day of that. Okay? Alright? What else? And after this, we'll, we'll take our break. And then go into multiple regression. The outliers in the 
young group, so it makes it's making it look like the variance is larger in the young group when really most of the data the variance is pretty similar to How do you make that judgment? All right, so I'm going to repeat for those that may not have heard that are online. If you're looking at the residual plot in where you see, and I'll pull the residual plot back down. If you look at the residual plot, you see there's a point right up here that seems to be in the young group that's extreme, 75. And then the rest of it looks, according to Megan, pretty, pretty, pretty stable. For your calls. All right, let me ask you this. Look at the box plots. Based on those box plots. Now understand the young group is having to, that long tail is out there capturing that outlier. That really long tail is out there capturing the outlier. The reason it's not declared an outlier here is I'm building box plots by group. The previous box plot was throw it all together. Mm -hmm. It should have all come from one distribution. All the residuals should be coming from one normal distribution with one variance, so it's fine to put them together. What does that tell you? What does that make you think? So it probably isn't an outlier in a young group. We would have, there's no way to answer the question besides, and we can't get back to the raw data or back to the investigator. Um, if you look at the, the second and third quartile lines, though, the... All right, so in other words, the lowest bar is the 25th percentile. 25% of your data falls below the 100 in the young group. The median looks to be, I'm going to guesstimate, that's a, that is a statistical term, guesstimation, uh, around 12 point, or 112. Mm -hmm. And then 75th percentile, 75% of the legs or the fevers were broken, somewhere around 140, okay, in the young group. Whereas you, from this graph, you can see for the elderly group, the 25th percentile is well below 75. Uh, even the median is below 75. There, the 75th is between 75 and 100, probably around 85, 90. Mm -hmm. Okay, you were going to say? If you look at the distance between the first and third quartiles for each group, that's... Which is the, called? The interquartile range. The distance between the, the, the height of the box is a robust measure of variance. It's about this. I mean, the boxes are approximately the same. Approximately the same. So you would vote, we have one vote that we're going to hold the assumption of equal variances. And with regard to our normal probability plot, we were, we, do we have a vote for that? Would you say that the, the data is, or the behavior of the residuals is normally distributed? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can't tell it from that graph, you tell it from the guy down here. That would help you to say, is that a reasonably bell? Yes. Or do I see gross deviations from the line? <clears throat> Let's not count that guy. That guy's pretty the guy the last point may be an outlier. Let's let's just say that right there. Could be an outlier. <laughs> so we just have to make a vote. All in favor of assuming equal variances, raise your hand. It's not like there's going to be a final grade. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to ridicule anybody. Who all is in favor? If you were if you were meeting with a statistician, would you believe that this person is going to come back and say, I'm willing to hold the assumptions? <laughs> okay, help. Okay. We have two votes for equal variances. <laughs> Great. All right, come on, folks. Do you want your break or not? Come on. Everybody? Yep. Yeah. You think they equal variances? No. 
No. Jake. Yes or yes? Yes. yes. Yeah. I say no. Oh. <laughs> now, does that mean I'm right and you're wrong? Do you understand what I'm trying to get across to you? It is a judgment call that has to be reported. What would I do here? Being a little nervous about, hey, there seems to be some trend, and I understand what you're saying, for, that, for the box plots, they're close, but I would dig a little bit deeper, and I would go and do another analysis called non-parametrics. Now, if everything lined up, I would report the ANOVA, that we checked the normality, and that we checked the assumption of variances, and we went as far as to do a sensitivity analysis to see if another procedure would that does not depend upon equal variances would have said the same thing and report all of it. So when you're setting up these you have young, middle-aged, and elderly. Yeah. And so I don't know, when, when you're looking at how they put these into these groups, I mean the young is 18 to 40. I know. Can you do 18 to like 30? Yeah, yeah, we've seen that. that. You, oh, you get, that's you a Oh, I mean, this, this is the type of this is the type of questions I've been expecting. So yes, we've got three groups. Well, this is a teaching example. Well, why couldn't I do four groups? Well, you could. have. Well, why can't I do five groups? You could. have. Why can't I just use the age of the individual directly? I could. All of them are options. All of them have pros and cons. The more groups I divide, if it's a fixed data set and I keep breaking it down, I get more and more nervous about having enough data to make a judgment about equal variances. If you put three in each of those cells, I can't make that judgment. I, there's just not enough information per, per group. So I need each group to be large enough to make a judgment. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean... I guess if you're looking at groups, so why don't you just use individual data points? And well, that brings up the question. Again, this is why the whole thing was to set up a discussion today to say, oh, now we've gotten to a point of, well, could we analyze it a different way? The answer to that question is always going to be yes. Why is that such a dangerous question? Too much work. No, <laughs> it's not so much too much work. That's Why is it a dangerous question? The more tests you run, the more likely you're going to find something positive. And the other thing, so the, yeah. the answer was the more tests I run, the more likely I am to find something that would be significant, or I would be pee hacking or pee shopping. <laughs> or the other answer is, is very sincerely, if you didn't state that you were going to do it in the specific aims, I've got a problem. Because we're, we're modifying our objective midstream. Okay? Now, I will answer it this way. I would, not, I would be willing to run the analysis and use it as a discussion, but I, I, I would have a hard time justifying the swap right in the middle. But you're exactly right. I've always got the option. That decision should be discussed not as we're analyzing it. That discussion should happen as we're designing the experiment. So I guess my question wasn't quite that. Okay. Is more why do you even, from a statistical perspective, why do you even group instead of doing an individual data? So you're always trying to correlate A B. Is this your All right. Bio another, bio? another excellent question. What they did here in this teaching example was to take a quantitative variable, which is age, it's a quantity, and then redefine it as groups. You're pointing out if you have two quantitative variables, there's no need to break one down. You could have just done correlation. You could have done simple linear regression. 
uh, if I had had their raw ages, I would have done that to show you what's going on. Why would you possibly break it down? Perhaps the assumptions of regression aren't being met, or you're afraid that the assumptions of regression can't be met. And the other way is you have to keep in mind sometimes variables naturally occur as categorical. Such things as race, such things as if I was doing a two-factor ANOVA, race by gender, those things, I can't do it, I've got to go to ANOVA. Okay? So if we disagree about judging, yes. Point if, yeah. did you say yeah? How about when? <laughs> don't you understand? Don't you remember the old adage, two of a trade will never agree? What do you get when you put three statisticians in a room? Disagreements? <laughs> Go ahead. Is it reasonable to use a lot of a hypothesis test like Wilk Shapiro or something to guide us? Ah, uh, so Wilk Shapiro. So here we go with the, again, the danger of all these hypothesis yes. testing. Uh, this is just for guidance. Just for guidance. <laughs> but so if I had done, for example, uh, Let's see, they didn't, unfortunately I did not request them last night. The question about Wilt Shapiro and other ones uh, helping judge the assumptions of the hypothesis test. I am leery for doing that because I can give you four hypothesis tests and they will disagree among themselves. And it's just that easy. It's always been one of the master projects or the dissertation projects I've always thought would be very easy to do is um, you have all these tests actually to go out and test normality. Is the data normally distributed, yes or no? And, but the problem is, is they're so sensitive and I can give you one data set and have two say yes, it's normal, and two say no, so they're not helpful. So how do you pick, pick, pick which one you want? So I've got to be careful there. So I would be very careful with that. Other questions? False. All right, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll go through regression and I'll do my standard thing of letting you out a little bit early. And then we just have coffee. 10 minutes.
She thinks that if I see that this is a comfortable one day, so the last one I'm not sure what she wants to do. Amen. 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 You know 
No, I'm just doing the first part. And then we're going to do that the second part. Look, I'm leaving that section out for now. Okay. And just writing the rest. Oh, okay. So just Right. Until she just wants to get started into it, because I'm sure, you know, you know, you know same oh. revision, same revision. So well, let's get that part through this. Oh, I don't know. Maybe she's not Okay, let's pick up with that multiple reg, reg problem, and this is the one that I think will show you one of the dangers and why you always want to sit down and talk two different uh, or talk through the results. Um, like I said before, if I use this, I could argue that I, and I have done it. I've pulled off a two-hour lecture on something as simple as this output. Uh, regression. What's the difference between regression and ANOVA? Regression is predictability. I can predict with ANOVA. Okay. What's the difference between regression and ANOVA? You've got a parameter estimate for the regression. I can get a parameter estimate out of ANOVA. Control and parameter. Mm -hmm. Oh, you just get a mean. You cannot adjust for covariance. All right. The difference being is in ANOVA, ANOVA is actually regression, but it's using only categorical predictors. That's it. The, 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 one of the things that statisticians are trained to understand over and over is that regression and ANOVA are the same model. It's just the different predictors are placed into them. Okay? Which is a key thing for you to always remember because what were the assumptions for ANOVA? Constant variance and normality. So those assumptions hold across the board. So you've got to keep that in mind. Now, you've already said it. Why do you go to regression? Why do you want to do regression? Well, sometimes you're doing regression because your predictor isn't categorical. It's actually continuous. And there's nothing to stop me from mi mixing and matching. Sometimes I want to be able to have categorical and continuous predictors in the same model. That one has a special name also called analysis of covariance. When you combine them, all categorical is ANOVA. All continuous people will refer to as regression. All but when you mix the type of predictors, we call it analysis of covariance. Guess what? They all have the same assumptions. And that's the key thing. And the reason before you before you check, before you ever submit anything that has a p-value with it, you will check its assumptions, or you will ask someone, has the assumptions been checked? The answer may come back and say, there are no assumptions, and there are tests out there that are trying to be built to be very few assumptions, but it doesn't mean you can't, you should not be asking. Okay, you always ask that question. All right, so here we go. This is one of my favorite teaching examples because you have an abstract to submit, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six p-values to begin with. How are you going to pick which of those six p-values you're going to report? It's a trap question. Who wants the trap? <laughs> Who wants the trap? Oh, I lost part of my audience. Oh, bad reviews. I'll see you in the press tomorrow. Go ahead. <laughs> Could potentially report each of them for different reasons. Okay, we could present, we could report all of them for different reasons. Do you know what all of them mean? <laughs> See, that's the thing. Please promise me this. You'll never report a p-value that you don't know what the hypothesis is testing. 
right? Because every p-value goes with a hypothesis. You report the p-value, you, you, you declare you understand what hypothesis is there. They're never separated. So, let's walk through it. Notice, as I told you, the very first thing, it, this is a regression problem, but it opens with a table called analysis of variance because it's truly still doing the same thing. What was the assumption for the um, ANOVA? That all groups had what? The same, we had to look at the box plot to determine if they all had the same variance. Well here, regression just says, regardless of where you are predicting, where, whatever, wherever you are, there's a constant variance. Because what we're building here, when we do regression, we're building lines. We're fitting lines through a set of data. And so as we go follow the line, the spread of the data around the line is constant. Okay? And because of that, because I'm assuming a constant variance, some of the variability is due to bouncing around the line, which is called the error. And some of the variability can be actually caught up by the line itself, because as you move, you see a trend according to X. So that's why we have two sources, one called model, which is your line or your regression line. How much of the regression line this is trying to estimate, is the regression line absorbing some of the variance? And is some of the variance just due to error? If the, if the regression line is not explaining any of the variability, is it useful? Is it useful? No. It would be useless. And that's what that whole table is trying to tell you. Okay? Because you see the degrees of freedom, it says four degrees of freedom. Do you know what that tells you immediately by looking at that? This is something for you. This is something you should ask to see if you're reporting a regression. Okay. You know what that four is telling you? Four predictors. There were four predictors in your model. Don't you want to know what's in your model? And if you told them to put four in and you see five there, don't you want to ask what's the fifth? Or better yet, if you told them to put four in and there's only three, mm -hmm. you might want to ask where's the missing suspect. Okay. So all that p-value, that first p-value, is useful, but it's not great. It's not great at all. All it's telling me is, is there at least one good predictor? Is at least one of the things in there useful in predicting this outcome? And the outcome is a classic teaching example. It's been used for decades training statisticians. It's called a scenic data set, 113, yeah, 113, 113 hospitals, and we were predicting infection risk for those hospitals for a given period of time. And we were just looking at the number of cultures that were being done. Well, I wasn't. The teaching example is the number of cultures. Is it a medical university or is it associated with a medical university? Yes or no. What's the average number of patients in the hospital? How many beds are in the hospital? The reason we use it as a teaching example is that it has every problem that a statistician pretty much can run into in a single day. So you get exposed to it all in one big data set. Or relatively, it used to be a big data set, these are small data sets. Okay? So as we come down, we start seeing all these p-values again. And you see that what I did is we talked about the average age of the patients in the hospital was used to predict the infection risk. The number of beds in the hospital was used to predict the infection risk. The average number of patients in the hospital during that time was used. And then the, the ratio of the number of cultures being done for the number of patients. Now, you look at that and I'm going to ask you, what are you going to report? Let's say that you were interested in saying that it was a factor of age. What would you say? Do you believe that age, trap question, be warned. Trap question. 
is age associated with infection risk? Is the average age of the number or the average age of the patients within the hospital associated with Not risk. Not based on this model. Not based on this model. Okay, we got one answer that says okay. no, not based on this model. I need other answers. What are your assumptions? My assumptions are that there's going to be normally distributed. But the residuals will be normally distributed with constant variance and that that's reasonable to put a line through the data. We're going to check all of those. Not everybody at once, folks. I'm going to take the leap here. So I'm going to say that yes, because it's one of the variables that were included that created um, there, there's at least one significant predictor, but looking at that, you can't say exactly which one it is. Okay, and see, thanks for taking the leap, yeah. <laughs> because you've led me right to the point I want to address. There are all these p-values for age. you got a p-value of 0 0.0922. If you're using an alpha of 0.05, you're going to say not significant. I mean, you could walk down the column here, NS, not significant, not significant, not significant, significant. The last one being the culture would be significant. It's a dangerous approach. The reason I brought it to you is to teach you why it's dangerous. I asked you, does age predict risk? That p-value is not appropriate for that question. That p-value is not appropriate for the question I gave. What that p-value, the 0.0922, actually is telling you is after adjusting for the number of beds, after adjusting for the number or the census, and adjusting for culture. If I choose to now add age into the model after controlling for those three, Age is not improving the prediction. That's all it's telling you. It's not absorbing additional variance. That's a different question than to say, is age and risk associated? Wrong model. Another reason to sit down and discuss these key concepts. In fact, every one of these, every one of these, um, have to be interpreted the same way. If I go to say culture is significant, I just can't say culture is significantly associated with the risk of infection. I have to say after controlling for age, beds, and census, then the addition of culture is associated. After accounting for the variability due to age, beds, and census, culture is associated with risk. Now, do you hear the key words I'm using? Often you will hear people say, I want to adjust for this, or I want to control for this. It's language indicating we're trying to move toward regression modeling. Anytime you have that thought, there are techniques that are outside of regression that do it, but almost all of them can be recast as a regression. Okay? Can you say that one more time? Sure. Sorry. You said after the controlling for age, beds, and census, then the addition of culture is significantly associated with risk of infection. Okay? And, you know, one of the things I will do on I mean, seriously, this is when I teach the regression modeling class, <coughs> I will come through and number these one, two, three, four, and make them write explanations for each and every one of them to see that they are consistently saying the correct thing. After adjustment for every other variable I see, then I would say this variable is either associated or not associated, comma, out equal to 0.05 with an infection risk. 
but you have to keep in mind, you must, it is completely bogus to say anything without saying after controlling for these variables. Okay? All right. That's one of the key things I want you to do is if you're doing regression and you're actually building models where you're trying to account for things or pull things out or adjust for them, you've got to list every one of those variables in your analysis section. Otherwise, you're not reporting the accuracy of the analysis or you're not, you're not reporting accurately what was done. All right? I have a question about that. Okay. So let's say you state in your method section that you are going to do this analysis and you're going to control for... And then you decide to do something else. No, no, no. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> but now if you state that in your method section, then do you... I guess the best practice would be to then repeat in your results after we control for X, Y, and Z. These sort of yes, I would. I would definitely do that. And I know that words in an article or words in an abstract are a premium. I understand that. But I do very much believe, especially in the results section, you telegraph it. We control for the following things. And in fact, I, I refuse to do, I tend to, when I help people publish regressions, I will show all their, I will, I will argue I'll clean it up and make it look a lot better. But everything in this table is going in. I'm not just going to show that one because that is misleading. That would be very misleading. Okay. All right. All right, so here we go. We've got to check our graphs. Uh, this is the first one. It's a big one. So this is the residual plot. What do I look for? It's just, it's, it looks very different from the residual plot from the ANOVA. It's not. It just doesn't have groups. This time I've got continuous. So all the, all the points are just spreading out all over the graph because we've got, we've got continuous predictors. Here's the simple thing you have to ask yourself. Do I see a pattern? Do you want to see a pattern? No, never. The one thing you really don't ever want to see in a residual plot is a pattern. Because the errors are supposed to be random, which means no pattern. And on top of it, they are supposed to have constant variance. So if you study this, and I can't, I'll see if I can shrink it a little while now. We'll just, if you study across it, do you think that you've got, you've got, an, you've got some that are high, but understand, we're talking about residuals running from 3 to negative 3. That's all perfectly reasonable. Okay, they're, they're not extreme because they've been standardized. Notice I said studentized residuals, so I'm comparing them to a normal distribution. And so all of them are falling between 3 and negative 3. And generally, yeah, you got some people who are out here extreme, but do you think that, do you see a shotgun blast? That's the typical thing you look for. You look for the fanning out of the residuals or the fanning in of the residuals. Do you, see, do you see a shotgun blast? No, not really. I would let this one go. I would say that we checked it, and I would say that I'm not necessarily worried about um, any pattern in the residuals, and I'm willing to accept the homogeneity of the variance or that the variance is constant. Okay? What's the other thing I have to check? What is the other piece that has to be checked for every regression? Hmm? The normality of the residuals. And that's why, again, we come in and I did ask SAS to grab all the residuals, uh, look at them, and we get down here and they should be bell-shaped, right? How's the histogram look for you? It looks beautiful. It doesn't look like it looks beautiful. I'm 
pretty pleased with that. Uh, I'm pretty pleased with that uh, histogram. I would be comfortable saying that we have achieved normality. We've got something that looks symmetric and it looks pretty much like a bell to me. Uh, and then we do the other thing. The, the better test is the QQ plot. You expect the points to hug the line. Folks, I'm going to have to simulate data to get a normal probability plot that looks better than that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to have to create data. And therefore, that is pretty, I'd be very comfortable at this point. But again, please don't submit, don't submit abstracts until either you have visually seen somebody and talked to somebody about these graphs. Okay, either you've seen them or you've talked to someone who says, yes, I have checked them. Okay, because again, once it's impressed, it's impressed. And do I have things that have my name on them, that has my name on it, that I wish I could get out of there? Yeah. Yeah. Always take the time to check the assumptions. Don't get obsessed. Notice one of the things that I wanted to do today. It's all about p-values. It's all about, no, it's not. It's all about making the right judgments and looking at the graphs before you get to the p-values. The p-values should be, pretty much be the very last thing you get to, okay? Even though they're usually the first thing we teach, or one of the first things we tend to teach in statistics. Questions? Other questions? <laughs> yes? Is there, so what about the practice of deciding what variables to put in your model? based on what you see significant differences in the data. That's okay, not okay, what are the arguments for it? All right, so it's very interesting because very early in my career, one of the papers I have, I came out of graduate school and I am cocky. I'm still cocky. <laughs> uh, But I believe in what's called a parsimonious regression model approach. In other words, I want to make models that are significant, and the things that are significant are, or the things in the model are significant. Uh, and if it's not in the model, you take it out. If it's not significant, you, you bring it down and you make it parsimonious. Uh, as I've practiced science over and over, I think it's wisest to take a um, more balanced approach that if as a clinician, if a clinician came to me and said, I believe we must control for the following things on a biologic basis, then I would uh, definitely include, them, include it in the model without any regard for whether it's statistically significant or not. Okay? And then those things are controlled for, and then we get to the set that they wish for me to test. Okay? Now, as we go in and build models, because I am, I'm, if, I, if I'm anything, I'm honest. Hypothesis testing and modeling, there's a blur. There's a fine line. Modeling, you're trying to build or explain more and more. So you get that first set, and as you've been studying the data, you recognize there's another predictor. And it wasn't in your analysis plan that you put into your grant. It was not necessarily there when you were considering it in your specific aims. But it has come about. I would still put it in there. Okay. I would put it in there, and I would report it, and I would report it as significant in the presence of the others. I would also ask my colleagues and my collaborators to add the sentence that this association was discovered as we were conducting the investigation and requires further confirmation in an independent data set. Period. Because that statement should be in every paper. Everything you do, someone should try 
to do it in an independent situation to see if it can be reproduced. But I would just put those cards on the table. I would be very uncomfortable to put it in there as if we had thought about it five years ago. Okay? So, uh, yes? So I have a question about collinearity. Usually the assumption is that all the predictors are independent. In real life, it is not. So in I've never, I've never, I've never assumed that they're independent. Yes. Never. In, so, fact, yeah, in fact, I wish I could build a lot of regressions that had independent predictors. But the reason, if they were independent, let's put it this way, if they were independent, regression would be a very useless tool. Mm -hmm. Useless. Because if they're independent of each other, I don't need to control for them. Well, as related to the outcome, they're not independent, but the predictors, you have four predictors. Right? Four predictors, and those four predictors are associated. Educational. They correlate. They correlate. It's highly correlated. It's called multilinear. And then you, you, you cram them in one model and, and, and nothing is with uh, in, you you uh, you want to as, estimate the effect of like uh, physical activity on the outcome. Mm -hmm. But physical activity is highly associated with income, education mm -hmm. and age. Mm -hmm. So if you put them all in one model, you interfere with the estimation of your of your You're over control. You're over control. Yeah. Yes, it's a very common You problem. take away the yeah, you adjust you You state the fact. Okay. You state the fact. It's going to you have to take it out. Yes, you be, just state you you always just be honest with it. Yeah, you you have two models. That right? you have two models and that you build this and that if you run it by itself it is associated. However, if you include the other predictors, the significance goes down, but it is likely attributable to multicollinearity, period. Okay. Let it go. Yeah, just, just let it go. Yeah. Just, just be honest. Be honest. Yeah. Okay. Always the best rules in statistics, be honest. The problem with flying is you've got to keep remembering what you said. <laughs> and as you age, you will realize that's too hard. So just tell the truth and then you don't have to worry about what you said. <laughs> so, so let them let them think about and let, it. And let them work it out. That's their job, yeah. is to just to have full disclosure. Okay. All right. Uh, that's all I got for today. If you got questions or things that you need help with, please contact me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jane. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Lola, Joe. So, yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, Yeah, no. <laughs> so you're kind of lost in the middle. Yeah, um, let me double check. Um, I do try to take them. Whether they come out or not is another, is another question. <laughs>